Shalom to all of you, my friends and family in our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, excuse me. Still working on getting over this sickness, so please bear with me. Welcome, my friends and family, to the Sword of Yehovah, or the Sword of Jehovah Ministries. I am Jay Kilton. Thank you, everyone, all of you, my brothers and sisters, my dear friends, for joining me for our weekly worship service as we bring the Torah to a close. I it's 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 difficult to even say. It's difficult to believe, but but here we are. It's taken a year and a half total because there's been some time in between where it's like I had my trip to Israel and and then all of the uh, the, the the work on the the documentary Am Yisrael Chai, which I would at least like to pause right now and at least you know extend a a big thank you to a Root Awakening International Ministries for uploading the documentary to their channel. Uh, it's received uh, a thousand views thus far. Hopefully, it'll get you know much more in the, the weeks and months to come because we really need to do everything we possibly can as Christians, as those that uh, with our Jewish brothers and sisters, we serve the God that is revealed here in the pages of the Bible. Do we agree on everything when it comes to theology? No, of course not. We don't agree on everything, but nevertheless, it is the Judeo-Christian values and principles that have been taught down through the ages as revealed in the Holy Bible that has, that is why we're here. I mean, it is the foundation of all of our lives, of entire Western society and civilization going back for centuries, many, many centuries. The reality is that the Jewish people are the people that God has chosen to bring his written word into this world and also his living word, his son Yeshua, into this world. You think about, say, like Haman of Persia and what he desired to do in the time of Queen Esther with the extermination of the Jews. That's what his goal was, to exterminate all of the Jews. And had that happened, well then, this book never would have happened. This book never would have been compiled. It never would have been actually, it, would have, it never would have ended up in our hands as we know it and love it and cherish it today. There would be no Bible and there would have been no Yeshua the Messiah. So we love Israel. We love our Jewish brothers and sisters, and there is so much mis misinformation and so many lies out there right now being told about the Jewish people and about the nation of Israel. And so, for those of you who have seen the documentary, Am Yisrael Chai, thank you for watching it, and if you would continue to share it, continue to spread it to our friends and family, we need to get it out to as many people as humanly possible. So we'd like to at least say that. Start with a thank you to A Root Awakening International Ministries for uploading the documentary to their channel. So, And good news, uh, they're also working on doing the Spanish subtitles for the documentary. And when those Spanish subtitles are finished, they're going to be uploading it to their Spanish-speaking channel, which, big news, I love that. So praise God. <laughs> but... Getting back to the Torah in this evening, it's it's difficult to say and to believe how after a year and a half of time of deep dives into these living waters of truth, here we are, Torah portion number 54, and we are bringing the Torah to a close this evening. So, And then as we continue in the Holy Bible, we're going to continue right into the book of Joshua, possibly into the book of Judges after that. But uh, whether we continue into Judges or not, certainly after, we're going to be getting into the prophets teaching series that I have planned. We're going to do the major prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel back to back to back. So something to look forward to. Thank you, my brothers and sisters, for joining me, not just this evening, but through the whole of this. It has been such a incredible blessing, such a uh, glorious experience coming to a deeper knowledge and understanding of God's Word by building ourselves on that foundation of truth, the Torah, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, or that final book, Devarim, meaning words, the words of Moses. And so here we are, Torah portion number 54, Vatzot Haber Acha, and it is the Torah draws to a close. 
here of the Sword of Yehovah Ministries, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1, to the end of the Torah, Deuteronomy 34, verse 12, as we gather together here Saturday, March 30th of 2024. But as always, before we begin, let's first come together with a word of prayer and thanksgiving, a word of praise to our Father in heaven as we break bread and drink wine or grape juice, your personal preference. This is what we do here at the Sword of Yehovah Ministries, is that before we open up the word and get right into our study, we always first remember what it's really all about. We remember the gift that our Father in heaven, Yehovah God, has sent into this world to save our souls. We remember that gift of Yeshua, that gift of salvation. And so... If you would join me, my brothers and sisters, in this word of prayer. Thank you. Dearest Father in heaven, the one and the only true God, Yehovah, Jehovah, the Almighty, we give praise to your hallowed name. We love your name, Father, for we know that despite everything that the enemy has tried to do to hide your name, your name is being revealed in these last days. We truly love your name, just as it's recorded in Isaiah chapter 56. We love you, Yehovah. We love your name, for we know that every time we speak your name, we are declaring that you were, you are, and you always will be. You are the one and the only true God. We love you and we love your holy son, Yeshua. We thank you, Father, for that gift of love. We hold this bread in our hands and we remember that gift. We focus our minds and our hearts on that gift. We remember that he bowed himself before you. He submitted his will to your will. He walked that perfect road that you have laid out for us in Torah, in your commandments. Yeshua never sinned. He never broke your law. He never lived contrary to your commandments. He never lived contrary to your will, but he is that physical manifestation of your will. He's that image of you, Father. He's that image of your heart, of your mind, of your love, your compassion, your holiness, your mercy, your grace, your justice, your wrath against evil. We thank you with all of our hearts, Father, for the gift of salvation. And we pray that that gift of love and mercy will always cover us. That when we fall short of your glory, Father, which we do often, every day, we pray, Father, that your grace empowers us and cleanses us. Your spirit will fill us and always guide us on that path of obedience to your word, your written word, and your living word. In Yeshua's name, we offer you all worship and all praise. Amen.
Thank you, my friends. Thank you so very, very much. And if you have the cup with you, the cup filled with the juice of the vine, whether it be grape juice or whether it be wine, your choice, but we we look into this and we remember the, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus. And we lift it to our Father in heaven to thank him for that gift. Great and eternal Yehovah, most holy God, holy, holy, holy Yehovah. We lift this cup to you, Father, filled with this juice of the vine. And we remember the true vine that you have offered to us, that life that we have to be grafted into. We thank you, Father, for Yeshua, for his life, his ministry. We thank you, Father, that you filled him and were with him, empowered him. We thank you, Father, that as we submit our will to yours, as we enter into that eternal covenant relationship with, with you, it is made possible because what you have done in sending your son Yeshua, that we can be grafted into that vine of life, that you, Father, have life in and of yourself. You have given that eternal life to your son, Yeshua, and you have given Yeshua that authority, all authority in heaven and earth to grant that same everlasting life to those whom he will, to those that are seeking life. And we do seek life, Father. We seek life and truth and goodness. We seek justice. We remember, Holy Father, that in your Torah, that is the word that is emphasized. Justice. Justice we shall seek after all the days of our lives. We seek after faithfulness. We seek after genuine goodness in this world. And we praise you, Father, that if there is any goodness in us, it's not us, but it's you. For you, Holy Father, are good. You are good. You are great. You are so magnificent and glorious. And we love you, Father. Thank you, Holy God, for the gift of your Son, Yeshua. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And as we hold this cup and lift it to you, we pray that we will be filled with your Spirit to empower us and give us courage until the day when your Son will return. We long for that day, Father. We need that day to come. May it come soon, Holy Father, when your Son will rule on the earth with your eternal power and authority. He will rule all nations with a rod of iron. He will rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. And may, may we be there on that day, Father, to be caught up into the cloud, found worthy to be the bride to the bridegroom. Hallelujah. Praise be to you, Yehovah, forever and ever, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you very much, my brothers and sisters. Thank you. And with that, Torah portion number 54, <laughs> bringing the Torah to a close. Whew, it just, I can't help it. There's, um, 
there's a there's a bit of a sadness. <laughs> you know, there is. There's a bit of a sadness because you know, this is this ministry, the Sword of Yehovah Ministries, officially established in November of 2016. This has always been a ministry that has been founded on the the truth of the Holy Bible, but specifically that foundation of the Torah. That foundation of God's law, his his will, his will written down, his heart written down, his commandments, which letter of the word and spirit and truth of, of the word is perfect, is flawless. This ministry has always been founded on that foundation, that rock of the Torah, but in this last year and a half, this has been the first time since the founding of this ministry that we have had a dedicated series where it is verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book of the Torah. And to have it be coming to a close after a year and a half of study and feasting and research and just this adventure, that's really the best word that comes to my mind to describe this last year and a half, is this great adventure of, of discovery. And there are things, there are things that I know now that I didn't know a year and a half ago. There are things that, as I've been doing my study and my research in preparation for these Torah portion teachings, there are things that I didn't know. Because that's the reality of the Holy Bible, is that you can read this book, you can study this book cover to cover dozens of times throughout your life. But every single time you wholeheartedly give yourself over to a study of the Word of God, there will always, always be something new. There will always be something there that you had not seen before. And I think about this last year and a half, and there have been so many things revealed, so many things that were once hidden that have now been brought to light. And we just got to give all praise to our Father <laughs> and all praise to His Son, Yeshua, for revealing these things, revealing these things through the written word of God, and through the spirit of God. So, there's a bit of a sadness in my heart this evening. I have to admit, there is. But nevertheless, we're just going to have to look forward to the future, when at some point in the future, who knows, we just may have to do the Torah again. You know, years down the road, we just may have to... Uh, open up the Torah once again and do a deep dive study. And, and who knows, maybe at that point in the future, because I, I've, I've had these thoughts myself, I've, I've, I've wondered about this, is that what about looking to the future and possibly doing a Torah portion series that's, that's myself, but also maybe a few other individuals? You know, like there are some amazing teachers out there that if there was a more of a, a collaborative study and teaching series done, that that has potential. That has a great amount of potential there. So who knows? It's all in our Father's hands, and we'll just have to look to the future for that. But with that, my brothers and sisters, let's get into Vezot Haberacha, which means this is the blessing, because here we are coming to Deuteronomy chapter 33, where Moses is blessing the tribes of the house of Israel. Deuteronomy 33, 1 through 34, 12, Saturday, March 30th of 2024, and we're going to get right into that as soon as, of course, we do a review of our last Torah portion teachings. We did a double Torah portion teaching, number 52 and number 53. And we started with Joshua going back to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 27, where it says, Yehovah speaking to Moses, give him, Joshua, some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. That you are to give Joshua some of your authority, Moses. Not all, because they're, they're as we will read in the final verses of the Torah this evening, 
never has there been a prophet like Moses. There, there really is only one, <laughs> okay? And the only prophet who is the prophet like Moses is the one who was prophesied to be the prophet like Moses, and that, of course, is our Lord Yeshua. Deuteronomy chapter 18, the prophecy of prophecies that Yehovah God would raise up from the house of Israel, a prophet like Moses. There's, there's Moses and there's Yeshua, okay? And yes, there's many great prophets, you know, from Elijah to Elisha to Samuel, uh, king and prophet David. There's many great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Malachi, Amos. They're great prophets, of course. But when you're talking about a prophet that's, that's like Moses, there really is only one, and that is our Lord Yeshua. And that's how the Torah is brought to a close, is that there, there never has been a prophet like Moses that Yehovah knew face to face, that had, that had dialogue, back and forth dialogue, one with another. And so when it comes to Joshua, Joshua is to receive some of Moses' authority so that the whole Israelite community will obey him. And Joshua was a man in whom was the spirit of leadership, but because he received some of Moses' authority, he also received that spirit of wisdom. It says here in Deuteronomy 34 that now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what Yehovah had commanded Moses. That before Moses had laid his hands on Joshua's head, and Joshua had received some of Moses' authority, Joshua had tremendous talent, so many abilities, so many gifts from God, among which was this, this spirit of leadership. He was a, a leader. He was a natural-born leader, and uh, an amazing, faithful, incredible man of God. I mean, when it came to that first generation coming out of Egypt, it was just Joshua and Caleb that were wholeheartedly faithful to Yehovah, and that was the reason why Joshua and Caleb were the only ones of that first generation that were permitted to enter the promised land. But a spirit of leadership is not enough. You can think of the example going back to the book of Numbers, if I remember correctly, where we've got the the spirit of Yehovah coming upon the 70 elders there in Israel, and then the spirit of Yehovah also rests on these two other people, and the two others who were beyond the 70, they begin prophesying among the house of Israel, among the tribes, and it's Joshua who complains about this. Joshua runs to Moses and complains to Moses and says, uh, my Lord Moses, you know, there's these other two that are prophesying in the camp. You got to put a stop to them. And Moses is like, what are you, what are you talking about, Joshua? Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, they're, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's like, I'm, I'm tired, Joshua, okay? I don't want the burden of being the sole prophet for all of these people, okay? They've received the Spirit of God to prophesy they're okay. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> so Joshua has so many gifts and abilities, but until... He had received that authority from Moses, some of Moses' authority. We can read right here that the reason why he has that spirit of wisdom is because Moses had laid his hands on him. That's why he then receives that spirit of wisdom to not just be a leader, but a wise leader. And that right there is what we need. That's what you need for a leader in ministry. In any sort of religious sphere, you need a wise leader as far as leading a flock or a congregation. Uh, politics, military, education, doesn't matter what the field may be. If you're going to be a leader in any field of life, you need to be a wise leader. And that's, those are gifts that you can only receive from the Almighty God. Because I can promise you this, there are plenty of leaders in this world, but wise leaders are few and far between because the world does not provide wisdom to you. You don't get wisdom from the world. The world doesn't give you wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. That's why James says in James chapter 1 verse 5 that if you are lacking wisdom, there's only one source you can go to to get it, to acquire it, and that's from God. 
And this is what Solomon, King Solomon, is talking about in the Proverbs, Proverbs uh, chapters 2 and chapter 3, that you need to seek wisdom with all your getting, as it says in the King James. Uh, with everything you have, seek after wisdom. And in seeking after wisdom, you're going to be seeking after the one and only true God because that's that's where it comes from. When Yehovah appears to King Solomon and says, hey, what 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 is it that you request? What is it that you desire? I desire wisdom. And so Joshua is filled with that spirit of wisdom. And then we got into chapter 31 of Deuteronomy where the message three times in Deuteronomy 31 is be strong and courageous. The first time it's Moses speaking to the whole house of Israel, be strong and courageous. Second time it's Moses speaking to Joshua specifically. And then the third time it's Yehovah God speaking to Joshua this is the message three times repeated, be strong and courageous. And this same message repeated three additional times in Joshua chapter one, all from Yehovah God directly to Joshua, be strong and not just courageous, but be strong and very courageous. And that is exactly who we need to be going into. <laughs> if you think about the promised land, you know, follow along with me here. Think about the promised land letter of the word image looking to the whole world because that's even our lord yeshua uses that that image is that when he says in the beatitudes that the meek shall inherit the earth the meek shall inherit the earth blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth he's drawing upon a psalm of david where david does not say the meek inherit the earth he says the meek will inherit the land as in the land of israel Yeshua is building on that, teaching the spirit and truth of it. Oh, it's that land of Israel, that promised land. It's an image of the world and the world in a time of great righteousness, like with the upcoming millennium, the millennial age that we are looking forward to. So Joshua and the Israelites are entering that promised land, letter of the word image, to take the land back from the pagans, take it back from the savages, take it back from the heathens, take it back from the wicked, to, to seize authority back from the hands of Satan, who has, see, who has taken that authority in the hearts of men and women and wicked men and women. In a spiritual sense, we should be doing the very same thing. They were commanded to do that and to be strong and very courageous. We need to do the same. We need to be strong and very courageous as we go out into the world to, if you will, wrestle, wrestle authority back out of the hands of Satan in that we are speaking the truth with boldness. We are rebuking the enemy. We are speaking... Uh, against all of the lies that are out there in the world, and there's a tremendous number of them. I mean, that's one of the one of the primary motives for me creating the documentary Am Yisrael Chai, is to be a tool used to speak against the lies. And there are so many lies. Be strong and courageous, and get out there and make disciples of all the nations, commanding them to do all things that Yeshua our Lord has commanded us to do. And when you have one, when you have one sinner who repents, who turns from his wickedness and turns to righteousness, the angels of heaven rejoice. The angels of heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. Because that's one person that's brought out from death and into life. That's one person that's brought out from the clutches of the enemy and brought into the hand, the almighty hand of the everlasting father. That's one person that that is no longer going to be on that wide and broad path to their destruction. This is this is how we this is how we wrestle with the 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 enemy as far as we 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 wrestle authority out of the hands of the enemy. It's by saving souls, leading souls to the truth. And so we need to be strong and very courageous. And we also talked about, of course, the Torah and how it comes to the end of Malachi 4.4. 4. You know, remember the Torah of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. We had a conversation. We uh, talked about uh, John the Baptist um, and how John the Baptist's motive, what he was you know, called to do, is turn the heart. He was a man. He was a prophet of God 
filled with that spirit and power of Elijah. And Elijah, the prophecy at the end of Malachi, how the Old Testament comes to a close, is that he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, the fathers, back to Abraham, back to Isaac, back to Jacob, and back to Moses, back to the beginning, back to Torah. And when the angel Gabriel is prophesying about the birth of John the Baptist to his father Zechariah, he words it differently. He does not say the heart of the children to their fathers, but the angel Gabriel quotes it in Luke chapter 117b as that he will turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Yes, because the righteous, the, the righteous fathers that are recorded in this book, they have wisdom. Where do you get wisdom? You get it from God. <laughs> they had that gift of wisdom. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua. He has the spirit of wisdom. And we need to do what we can, getting back to saving those souls. We need to work to turn their hearts, teach them the truth, and have them have the, quote, disobedient, as in those who are disobedient to the commandments of God, turn back to the wisdom of the fathers, wisdom of the righteous. We got into chapter 32 of Deuteronomy. We went through the Song of Moses, an incredible Song of Moses, and we also covered the, the first Song of Moses from Exodus chapter 15. And then we looked to the final book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation of Yeshua Messiah, where it talks about the bride, who is uh, metaphorically talked about with the number 144,000, and that no one could learn the song, this, this new and everlasting song, except the 144,000 or except the bride who had been redeemed from the earth. And this eternal song is what's known as the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. That they, the bride, they held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And we concluded last time getting back to the Torah. That the Torah, it says in Deuteronomy 32, that we need to carefully obey all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. And how the Torah is actually defined in this way is that Psalm 119 says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the Torah of Yehovah. Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your Torah is the truth. Uh, Psalm 19 says the same, Psalm 19, verse 7, that the Torah of Yehovah is perfect, and it goes on and says that it is the truth. And then also Deuteronomy 32, 47, obey carefully all the words of this Torah. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life, the way, the truth, and the life, the written form. And of course, our Lord Yeshua, the living form of God's word, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen and hallelujah. And with that review and uh, discussion, I mean, we talked about a few things there that uh, so important, so important that we understand these things. We get into words or devarim, the words of Moses, chapter 33, and it begins like this. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, and I'm just going to pause right there. Moses, the man of God. We've now been going through the life of Moses for four books. I mean, Moses also you know, wrote the book of Genesis. But we're not introduced to Moses in the book of Genesis. It start, In Genesis, it starts with the creation and obviously Adam and Eve and the fall. And then it goes to Joseph in Egypt. And that's where it concludes. It concludes with uh, the death of Joseph. And so that's Genesis. And then you get into Exodus. And it's in Exodus that we're first introduced to Moses. Moses, who was born during a time of tremendous tribulation... The Israelites, who have now been in Egypt for, by that point, it would have been, you know, over a century of time. And he's born in a time when the Pharaoh is commanding that all male children, all male Israelite children, throw them into the river. Throw them into the Nile. And we have 
those that are strong and very courageous. We have the the Hebrew midwives that are strong and very courageous there in Exodus chapter 1, but we also have, of course, um, Moses' parents who are hiding him. And then he's taken down to the river, put in a basket, and sent adrift, sent out there in into the waters. The faith, the courage, that just trusting the life of their child into the hands of the Almighty and sending him out into the waters. It's how Moses' life begins. And the daughter of Pharaoh finds him, pulls him out of the river, calls him Moses, meaning to that image of drawing him out from water. And he's raised in Egypt for the first 40 years of his life. And seeing the affliction that his brothers and sister Israelites are going through at the hand of the Egyptians, seeing the the horrible injustice that's being done to them, he kills an Egyptian, hides his body in the sand. It's discovered he flees Egypt, goes into Midian, where he meets Jethro. He meets a woman uh, that he falls in love with, Jethro's daughter, Zipporah. They get married. They have a family together, and he spends 40 years there in Midian as a shepherd. He's now 80 years old, and he has his encounter with the angel of Yehovah sent to speak the direct word of Yehovah God there in the blazing fire of the burning bush. He's commissioned to go back into Egypt, and he goes back into Egypt with authority from the Almighty God, and there are are the miracles, the plagues upon Egypt, and then there's the exodus and the parting of the Red Sea and and to the mountain, the Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and everything. And we're 40 years later, 40 years in the wilderness, dealing with a stiff-necked and idolatrous and stubborn, hard-hearted people. He's now 120 years old. And at the end of his life, He's called Moses, the man of God. You know, it it reminds me of um, what's recorded in James chapter 2 concerning Abraham. That Abraham, because of his faith, worked out through his actions, his righteous actions, he was seen as righteous before in the eyes of the Almighty, and that he was called the friend of God. And so you have Abraham, Father Abraham, who was called the friend of God. You have Moses, who is called the servant of God, but he's also called the man of God. These are the things that are eternal, brothers and sisters. These are the things that last. The stuff of this world, it's all going away. It's all going away. This heaven, this first heaven and this first earth will pass away. As 2 Peter chapter 3 says, with a great noise, with this loud explosion, it's all going away. Everything of this world is all going to be gone. Dust, blown away by the, the breath, the wind of the Almighty God. The stuff that lasts is this kind of stuff. Being called the friend of God. Being called the servant of God. Being called a man or a woman of God. That is eternal. That is everlasting. The world comes in and tells you to seek after all of this stuff and to seek after the honors of men and the honors of the world and all of these riches and fame and fortune and the spotlight and and all of those titles <laughs> that the world offers all of that honor that the world offers it it all goes away what does it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world and lose us, their own soul yeshua says this to the pharisees is that you pharisees 
The only thing that you care about is the honor of men. But the honor that you should seek after is the only honor that matters, the honor from the one and only true God. Because that lasts. That is everlasting. You see, and that's, that's what I desire. And I know you desire the same thing. I don't want to be called a friend of the world. Because to be called a friend of the world is the same thing as being called an enemy of God. I would much rather be called an enemy of the world and be called a friend of God. I want to be known. I want to be remembered as, as a man of God. And this is how Moses is remembered. It's not just as a man of God, but the. He is the man of God. And that's just like our Lord Yeshua. Is Yeshua is, is the prophet like Moses. And Yeshua is also the, he's the second Adam. He's the second man. He is the man of God. And this is how Moses is remembered. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. He said, Yehovah came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with, or can be translated as he came from, myriads of holy ones from the south. That's how the NIV translates it, myriads of holy ones from the south. It, it's a difficult, it's a difficult Hebrew phrase to translate. There's, there's some dispute how it should be translated. Um, I do think that the NIV is points to the NIV there. I think that that is accurate, is that it's an image of that what I think it's, it's Moses is drawing upon is this image of uh, the holy ones in the heavenly realms, the angels. You know, you read the book of the Revelation of Yeshua Messiah, and in chapter 5, you have, starting in chapter 4, you have the throne room of Almighty God, and Yehovah God on the throne, and there are the four living creatures around the throne, and then the 24 elders also around the throne. And these 24 elders, when the four living creatures say, Holy, 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 Yehovah God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, those 24 elders, they get off those thrones of righteousness, and they take those crowns off their heads, and they place them before the feet of the Almighty God. And they sing praises to the Almighty God. But then when you get into chapter 5, this same scene continuing, John in vision sees numberless concourses of heavenly hosts, heavenly angels, just innumerable angels all surrounding the Almighty Father. And that's what I, I think that you know Moses is drawing upon. It's that same image, is that he... He came with, or he comes from, that image of myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. Surely it is you who love the people. All the holy ones are in your hand. At your feet they all bow down, and from you receive instruction. <laughs> Getting back to those, those 24 elders in uh, chapter 4 of the, the Revelation. They bow down before Yehovah. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who or what or how glorious or how powerful. Does not matter. You're not the Most High. <laughs> Yehovah is the Most High God. And all bow before the Most High. And we receive instruction. We receive instruction from the Most High. And that word instruction it's the most accurate translation of what Torah, Torah is. Torah is instruction. So either translated as instruction or as law, that's what Torah is. And we receive this from the Father. So at your feet, they all bow down and from you receive instruction. The law, the Torah that Moses gave us, the possession of the assembly of Jacob. He was king over Yesh Yeshurun, Yeshurun meaning the upright one, speaking of Israel. Israel, uh, a few times, these are, there are two times in the Torah, in these last couple of chapters of Deuteronomy, Israel is referred to as this Yeshurun, the upright one, an image of God's people, the way they should be. 
that he was king over Yeshurun, meaning the upright one, when the leaders of the people assembled along with the tribes of Israel. And getting into the next verse of chapter 33 is when Moses begins blessing first the tribe of Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, the firstborn of Israel. But I thought it would be appropriate to go back and do a quick reading of the blessing that Father Jacob left his 12 sons, the, the literal sons who would become the tribes of Israel. And it's appropriate because that's, that's how Genesis is coming to a close. When you look at the final chapters of the book of Genesis, that's how they're coming to an end, is when Father Jacob is offering his blessing to these 12 sons. And now we've been in the story of Moses for these four books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now the coming to the very end of Deuteronomy, and it's... And it's ending the same way. It's ending with Moses now giving this blessing to the tribes. It is interesting, though, and I have to at least point this out right here, is that for whatever reason, Simeon is not mentioned. I don't know why. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, no one knows why. <laughs> it's like, uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, when it comes to these blessings that Moses is, you know, offering to uh, the tribes... Uh, Simeon, who was the second born of the uh, house of Israel, he is not mentioned among these blessings. Not sure why that, uh, that would be. But getting to the end of the book of Genesis, we have Father Jacob, who was called Israel, he who wrestles with God and man and comes off victorious. He offers his blessing to his sons. In Genesis chapter 49, it reads, Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power, turbulent as the waters. You will no longer excel, for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. That's what Reuben most certainly did. And and many of these these declarations, these blessings, or these prophetic statements given to these literal sons is speaking literally of that son and not beyond that, whereas some are indicating the posterity that goes beyond. But at least with Reuben, this is... You you should have been, you should have been really that one that is excelling in honor and might and uh, power, but not, uh, not one who was, quote, turbulent as the waters. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. And this is because Simeon and Levi were the ones that went in to the city of Shechem and when all the men of Shechem had been circumcised and they were weakened, extremely, extremely weakened, Simeon and Levi went in and they, they killed all of the men of the town. Yeah, their swords are, are certainly weapons of violence, these two brothers. Let them not enter, let me not enter their council, let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger, so fierce, and their fury, so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. And that's, that's the reality when it came to those two. They, what they did was horrendous. What they did was just absolutely vile. There was, there was a, a town, a people, that they had a willingness to join with Israel, a, a willingness to join with, with Jacob in a, a covenant family relationship. And Simeon and Levi, they said, nope, we're not going to have any part of this. And they took advantage of these people's weakness when they were at their weakest and you know did horrendous, horrible things. And that's that was Simeon and Levi. But then we got Judah and what Jacob says concerning Judah is, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. 
Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to arouse him? The scepter, that image of power, that image, image of kingly authority, the scepter will not depart from Judah. <laughs> the scepter will not depart from Judah. And here we are from that point till today. Now you're talking about 3,700 some odd years, a long, long time. And you know what? 1,700 years, some odd years after this, we have he who is king of the Jews that came into the world, and the scepter will never part from his hand. No. And it's the same thing when it came to the, uh, the diviner, the, uh, the pagan prophet Balaam is that the final uh, fourth prophecy that he gave is that speaking a true word of Yehovah, he declares that a, a star will arise. He sees this star of the house of Israel, of uh, Judah and a scepter of power right here in the tribe of Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Hallelujah. Amen. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun will live by the seashore and become a haven for ships. His border will extend towards Sidon. Issachar. Issachar is a raw-boned or a strong donkey lying down among the sheep pens. When he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. Dan. Dan will provide justice for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider tumbles backward. And it needs to be pointed out that no, there's, there's so many ideas and so many interpretations out there about what all of these blessings are talking about. Some of them are very clear. Some of them are exceptionally clear. Like we, as we were reading, well, Reuben and uh, Simeon and Judah, those were simply declarations about the wickedness of those three boys, of those three men, and just the, the horrible things that they had done. But then you get to Judah and the prophecy concerning Judah going to the, the king who will come from the tribe of Judah is so apparent, so clear, absolutely crystal clear. But then there are these others that it's we, we don't know. Because a lot of the context, the historical understanding of these situations, we just do not know. And that also remains true when we get to Deuteronomy 33 with Moses' blessing for these tribes. Some of the blessings are crystal clear, absolutely clear. We know exactly what you know God is saying through Moses concerning these tribes. And then some of them are more obscure. And I think just the reality is that being 3,700, or in Moses' case, 3,500 years, departed or separated from the history and the context of these people and these specific individuals and tribes, there are, there are things that we just simply do not understand. But it has at least been hypothesized that Dan, being one of the border territories of Israel, he was a, a strong tribe, a tribe that uh, defended the house of Israel or the whole nation of Israel from uh, encroaching enemies from the north. That is at least one possibility, that he bites the horse's heels so that its rider tumbles backward. And I do love, of course, how the blessing for Dan ends there in verse 17, and then Jacob simply has this declaration that he gives in verse 18, Genesis 49, 18, I look for your deliverance, Yehovah, is what he says. Amen. I look for your deliverance, Yehovah. That's what we all are saying concerning our Father in heaven. Father, 
We are looking for your deliverance. We are looking for your salvation. We are looking for that king who has come that you have raised up from the tribe of Judah as you promised you would. And we are looking for his return. We are looking for that time of everlasting deliverance and salvation. May it be soon, Father. Amen. That's what Jacob says. I look for your deliverance, Yehovah. Amen. Gad will be attacked by a band of raiders, but he will attack them at their heels. Asher's food will be rich. He will provide delicacies fit for a king. Pretty nice. Nephtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Nice. And Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful vine. And this needs to just be pointed out right here, you know, before we even get, you know, further into this, is that this blessing given to Joseph, this is one of those examples of a lot of people having so many ideas what it's talking about. But the reality is the blessing that Jacob gives to Joseph has already been given by this point. It was given in the chapter previous when Jacob is giving the blessing and he crosses his hands. He's giving the blessing to Manasseh and Ephraim and he crosses his hand and puts his right hand on Ephraim's head, the second born. And Joseph steps in like, oh, no, 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 no. dad, you got it all wrong. He's like, son, come on. I, I've been doing this a long time. I, I know what I'm doing. I, I, I got this. I got this. <laughs> the 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 second born the blessed second son is the image there um it goes on and says that jacob gives a blessing to joseph and it's the blessing given to joseph is the blessing that's given through his his posterity through manasseh and and ephraim so the actual blessing to joseph by this point has been given this right here in chapter 49 of genesis is more much more of just that statement of what God has already done for Joseph in that Joseph was mistreated and betrayed by his brothers and sold as a slave into Egypt and cast down, you know, he, you know, with, he was, um, uh, brought into a circumstance where he fled from that, you know, from committing adultery with Potiphar's wife, but he's accused, he's put in prison and God brings him out of that to be the right hand man of Pharaoh there in Egypt to rule Egypt as the second in authority. And so Jacob says, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. And that image of over a wall is just the image of his, his, his life being blessed by God is so fruitful that he can't be contained. <laughs> they tried to contain him inside a prison, but it just doesn't work. He's, he's flowing over that prison wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed limber. Because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and womb, your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, they are than the bounty of the age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among, or the prince who was separated from his brothers. That's what that is all about. And trust me, because I come from, I was born and raised in the false religion of Mormonism, and Mormons just, they, they have their own whacked out, totally, you know, totally divorced from the context idea about what that's saying and they they tie it in with uh, america and the founding of america and them and the uh, the lds church i mean they they go off and off and off like hey that that's that's about us that's about the mormons no it's not i can promise you that it has nothing <laughs> has nothing to do with america it has nothing to do with mormons <laughs> nothing whatsoever that is simply a declaration as what god has done for Joseph. The blessing given to Joseph, once again, was given in the chapter previous. And Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides 
the plunder. And there we have it. That's the the blessings that were given to from Israel, from Father Jacob at the end of the book of Genesis to his literal sons. But now we're going to get to Moses giving that blessing to the tribes of Israel. We've already read verses 1 through 5 and what Moses has said. And we will get right into what he says about Reuben coming up after this short two-minute intermission. Thank you very much, my brothers and sisters, for joining me thus far. Stick with me. Two short minutes. We'll be right back. See you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Let's go, go, go. Here we are, Deuteronomy 33. And in verse 6, he says concerning Reuben, Let Reuben live and not die, nor his people be few. Okay. (laughs) It's like, fair enough. Let, Let Reuben live and not die. And... Perhaps, you know, Moses is drawing upon the the image of what the, the father of the tribe, you know, Reuben, who was he who was turbulent as the waters, who did, you know, the, the horrible thing that he did. You know, he's maybe drawing upon that. I don't know. Um, this is one of those cases where we just we don't have the context. We just don't know. Um, but at least what uh, Moses says is let Reuben live and not die. And but it, but it. This is interesting. I have to at least point this out, is that you have Reuben and you also have Gad, who they were the tribes that that chose to stay on the Transjordan side of the Jordan River, the east side of the Jordan. Now, their their men do go with... (laughs) Excuse me. (coughs) Oh, excuse me, brothers and sisters. Still trying to fully recover here. I apologize. Their men do go with Joshua into the promised land to clear out the land of all the pagan nations, but they leave their wives and their children and their flocks and herds on the uh, the Transjordan side of the Jordan. And we don't hear about Reuben or Gad from this point forward. I mean, we really, we really don't. I mean, we know that they're on that side of the Jordan River. And we have this blessing here from Moses concerning Reuben. Let him live and not die. Let his numbers not be few. But as far as the books to come, there's 
not really much, if much of anything, uh, concerning Reuben. We just we don't hear about Reuben uh, from this point forward. Not really. So let Reuben live and not die, nor his people be few. Judah, and this is what I'm saying. Simeon is skipped. Simeon was the second born, and he's not mentioned. <laughs> he's he skipped. I don't know. I honestly have no idea why, nor do I know anyone out there that has any idea why. But uh, Simeon is not mentioned. Judah, who was the third born, Moses says, and this and this he said about Judah. Hear Yehovah, the cry of Judah. Bring him to his people. With his own hands he defends his cause. Oh, be his help against his foes. And here we, you know, I at least have to point this out. Because during the, the two-minute intermission, I was uh, skimming some of the comments in the live chat. Thank you for your comments, by the way. And we have a few of these individuals, like uh, Brother David, who says, Congratulations, Jake, for the Israel video, the documentary. May God uh, continue to be, bring blessings to this ministry to help others discover the truth. And Sister uh, Diana says, Congratulations for the documentary. Excellent work. God bless you and give you your health. Thank you, uh, Brother David and Sister Diana. Thank you very much. And obviously the documentary is about the nation of Israel, but primarily... We have the Jews. Now, it needs to be understood that from the time of the Babylonian captivity till today, anyone that is really of the house of Israel is considered just under that, that standard word of being a Jew. And Mordecai, from the book of Esther, is the perfect example of this, is that Mordecai was not a Jew of the tribe of Judah. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. But he was known as Mordecai the Jew. He was just that everyone that was just called a Jew from that point forward. So we have the ten tribes of the north that were destroyed by the Assyrian Empire and they were dispersed among all the nations. But then we have the southern tribe of, or the southern kingdom, excuse me, of Judah, which would have been the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin. But then also there would have been a tremendous, there would have been a number of Levites, a lot of Levites among them as well. And then we can certainly say that there would have been some, you know, individuals from those other tribes of the north that had come down into the south. But from this point forward, they're just always referred to as simple as Jews, whether they are of the tribe of Benjamin or the tribe of Levi or the tribe of Judah. They're just all referred to as Jews. And here we are today, 3,500 some odd years from when Moses is speaking this blessing over Judah and we see this blessing being fulfilled, is that Yehovah God truly has been a help for Judah against all of his foes, against all of his enemies. That is so true, is that what we are seeing today, unlike any point in, you know, in any point in the past, the nations of the world conspiring against and gathering against the Jews, gathering against the nation of Israel. And this will only continue to escalate all the way until that prophesied time when every nation will be gathered against Israel. Every nation will be gathered against the letter of the word, house of Israel, which is those, uh, the Jews who are there literally in the literal land of Israel. And every nation will be gathered against the spirit and truth of the house of Israel, those that are clinging to their testimony of Yeshua Messiah, those that cling to their testimony of the word of God, and those that do the commandments of God. They keep the Torah. They are obedient to God's word. That's where, that's where it's going. It's as plain as day. It's, it's so obvious that Satan is simultaneously moving on two fronts. He's moving on a literal letter of the word front against the, the letter of the word Israelites, and he's moving in a spiritual sense against the, the, the spiritual house of Israel. And this is where it's going. But just as God, and then this is, this is the beautiful thing, is that just as Yehovah God has been down through the millennia a help for Judah against 
all of Judah's enemies and still is their help to this day, preserves them and protects them to this day, so too Yehovah God is our help. For those that are of the spiritual house of Israel, I, I am an Israelite of that, grafted into that eternal house. You, if you have been born of God's Holy Spirit through faith in God's Son, Yeshua Messiah, you are no longer a Gentile. You are an Israelite. You also belong to that eternal house, that eternal family of God. And Yehovah God is, is my help. Yehovah God is your help, just as the blessing promises. So, O oh, be his help against his foes. Amen. About Levi, Moses said, Your Thummim and Urim belong to your faithful servant. The Urim Vetumim, uh, the, two, the two instruments that were put in the breastplate of the high priest that were used from this point forward, at least until they were very likely lost at the time of the uh, Babylonian captivity and the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, the Urim Vetumim, or lights and perfections, or light and truth, is what it's you know translated as. These were instruments used by the high priest to determine the will of Yehovah God concerning certain uh, circumstances and situations that they just didn't. They didn't know exactly what they could do or should do in that particular circumstance. And so of the tribe of Levi, it said your Thummim and or your Tumim and Urim, your perfections or truth and light belong to your faithful servant. They belong to the, the tribe of Levi, specifically because the priests are of the tribe of Levi. You, Yehovah, you tested him at Massah. You contended with him at the waters of Meribah. He said, or Levi said, of his father and mother, I have no regard for them. He did not recognize his brothers or acknowledge his own children, but he watched over your word and guarded your covenant. What Moses is drawing upon there, it, sir, I mean, th I, this seems to be you know, very, very clear, is that he's drawing upon the golden calf incident where even though it was Aaron of the tribe of Levi it was Aaron it was Moses's older brother Aaron 3 years older than Moses who was the very one who crafted the golden calf when it came time to make a decision about whom you're going to serve and what side you're going to be on it was only the tribe of Levi, where the whole tribe of Levi gathered to Moses. Moses said, those that are for Yehovah, those that are with me, come to me. And it was the tribe of Levi that came. And that's when Moses says to the men of Levi, take your swords, go among the house of Israel, among the, the tribes of Israel, those that are participating in this idolatry and this this extreme wickedness of the worship of the golden calf and slay this is the judgment from Yehovah God concerning this this wickedness and this idolatry and the Levites the men did just that they were obedient to that command and so for them it's like doesn't matter they they Yehovah God is first and foremost and so he, Levi, said of his father and mother, I have no regard for them, and he did not recognize his brothers or acknowledge his own children, but he watched over your word and guarded your covenant. He, he was obedient, even when the command was extremely, <laughs> unbelievably challenging, but uh, he was obedient. He, Levi, once again, teaches your precepts to Jacob and your Torah to Israel. He offers incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. Bless all his skills, Yehovah, and be pleased with the work of his hands. Strike down those who rise against him, his foes, till they rise no more. Amen. Benjamin. And you'll notice that it's, it's all over the place here. It's all over the place. And, and you'll have to forgive me. I, I said earlier, I made a mistake. I said earlier that Judah was the third born. That was a mistake. 
Judah was the fourth born. Levi was the third born. And the reason why, you know, the mistake was made is because when Moses is giving the blessing to the tribes of Israel, he he doesn't go in order of birth. He does not go in order of birth, not like Jacob. Jacob is going in order, whereas Moses, he starts with Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, but then he skips Simeon, and then he goes to Judah, who was the fourthborn, and then he goes to Levi, who was the thirdborn, and so he's, he's, he's all over. And then he goes to Benjamin. He goes from Levi, who was the thirdborn, all the way to Benjamin, who was the youngest, who was the twelfth. <coughs> Excuse me. About Benjamin, he said, Let the beloved of Yehovah rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long, and the one Yehovah loves rest between his shoulders. And then he goes to the eleventh born, Joseph. And about Joseph, he said, May Yehovah bless his land with the precious dew from heaven above and with the deep waters that lie below. With the best the sun brings forth and the finest the moon can yield. With the choicest gifts of the ancient mountains and the fruitfulness of the everlasting hills. With the best gifts of the earth and its fullness and the favor of him who dwelt in the burning bush. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince, among, or also could be translated as separated from his brothers. And that's going back. If you remember, we go back to the blessing that Jacob gives to Joseph. That second paragraph, it says, your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, ancient mountains then the bounty of the age-old hills, let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among, or the prince who was separated from, his brothers. <laughs> it's very obvious what Moses is thinking here. Moses is drawing upon what Father Jacob had said uh, a few centuries earlier, that he mentions here the choicest gifts of the, quote, ancient mountains, and then he says those exact same words, let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince, separated from his brothers. In majesty, he is like a firstborn bull, his horns are the horns of a wild ox. With them, he will gore the nations, even those at the ends of the earth. Such are the ten thousands of Ephraim, such are the thousands of Manasseh. And that also goes back to what I said previously about the, the blessing that Jacob actually gives to Joseph is the blessing that he bestows upon him through his posterity, through Manasseh and Ephraim. And it's the same thing here. He specifically mentions such are the, 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 the strength of Joseph is the strength of his children or his posterity. So such are the ten thousands of Ephraim, such are the thousands of Manasseh. Now, I want to pause and focus on this. This is very, very cool. I love this so much. So let's focus on this statement. Him who dwelt in the burning bush. I want to first mention that the word burning there is not in the Hebrew text. It's not there. There are multiple English translations that will put it there in the English translation, like the NIV does, uh, the NLT does. Um, a few others do. I can't, I, I, I want to say maybe the new, no, no, the new King James does not do it. Maybe the NASB does. There, there are multiple English translations that will insert the word burning for burning bush, but in the Hebrew burning is not there. Okay. Is that wrong for these translations to insert the word burning when in Hebrew that word is, is just not in the manuscripts? No, I wouldn't say so, not in this case, because we know with absolute certainty, absolute certainty, what, quote, bush Moses is referring to. We know exactly what he's referring to, and we can know it from the Hebrew language. And this is so cool. I, I love this so much, is that in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, there are actually seven different words 
for the singular English word that we have for bush. I mean, you see a bush and it's like, okay, well, that's a bush and that's all we got in English, right? But in Hebrew, there are seven, and maybe that's not a coincidence either that there are seven, but there are in fact seven different Hebrew words. All of them can be translated as the English word bush. However, one of these seven Hebrew words for bush is only used here in Deuteronomy 33, and it's only used in one other chapter of the whole Bible. Can you guess which chapter? <laughs> well, let's first go to Strong's Hebrew Concordance, 5572, and the Hebrew word for bush is sne, sne. And it's perhaps a blackberry bush, we, you know, we're not entirely sure, or, but it's a bush, it's a thorny bush, it's of uncertain de uh, deviration, we're not entirely sure. But what we do know for absolute certain is that this word only appears a total of five times in the whole of the Bible. It appears once, as we just read in Deuteronomy 33, with that blessing given to, to um, uh, Joseph. Uh, through his children, Manasseh and Ephraim. And then the other time it appears, a total of four times in the first four verses of Exodus chapter 3, which reads, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of Yehovah appeared to him in flames of fire from within a sne, within a bush. Moses saw that though the sne, the bush, was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When Yehovah saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses Moses, and Moses said, here I am. That's, that's it. There is no other place in all of the Hebrew scriptures where this Hebrew word appears. It appears those four times in Exodus chapter 3, and then it appears once in Deuteronomy 33. Moses uses this one word, sene, to obviously be that image of the burning bush. And that's why I would say that it's not, it's not a problem that you have these English translations that insert the word burning there. It's there to help us know, oh, this is the bush that he's referring to. And yes, it absolutely is the bush that he's referring to. And we can know that because it's the only word that's used for that specific bush. And this is very cool, of course, is that the mountain we all need to we all need to acknowledge that anciently the mountain was known as Horeb. That's what it says right here. We just read it in Exodus chapter three, is that Moses he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The mountain anciently was called Horeb, but why is it called Sinai? Like, I mean, we know it as Mount Sinai. But why? Why is it called Sinai? That's not how the locals knew it. That's not the actual name of that mountain as far as it was named anciently. It was named anciently as Horeb. It's called Sinai because that Hebrew word means my bush, my sne. The, the same word that is used for the burning bush. That's what Moses ended up calling the mountain. He was there at Horeb, at the mountain of God. He has this divine encounter with the Almighty through the form, the image of the, the angel of Yehovah, the angel that is sent to declare that direct word of Yehovah God. And when Moses is you know, commissioned by God through his angel to then go into Egypt with this power and this authority to liberate the Israelites out of that iron furnace— well, Moses then started calling the mountain Sinai for this instant, for this reason. It's because that was the mountain where I had this encounter at the burning bush or that, that, that my, my bush, Sinai, my bush, the mountain of my Sinai. 
And so that's why it is called Sinai. It comes back to this, this Hebrew word, sne, meaning bush. And that, of course, goes back to this blessing to Joseph. He's referring to the favor of him who dwelt in the bush or the sne at that mountain that I then started calling my, the mountain of my bush. It was the burning bush. So very cool there. Absolutely love that. But then also want to focus on this really quick. So dwelt in. Okay. Got to stop here and also focus on this. Him who dwelt in the burning bush. That's the Hebrew word, 7931. It's shakan or saken. And it, what it means is to settle down, to abide or dwell. To abide, abides, to camp or camping, continue, to dwell, dwelt, establish, live, lived, lives, living, remain, remained, remains, rest, rested, set, settle, settled, settled down, to stay or staying. It's... It's the image of coming into a area and remaining in that area, abiding in that area, dwelling in that area, living in that area, if you will. And this is the same word that so many you know Christians know. Uh, they they certainly mispronounce the word. You know they they call it. Uh, they, the Hebrew word is Shekinah, Shekinah, but, you know, Christians will be saying Shekinah, Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory. This is the word <laughs> that Moses is referring to him who dwelt in the burning bush. And that that was the, the glory of the almighty God, that glory, that Shekinah that was in the midst of that bush. This is. The, the same glory that abides over the temple in the, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, the same fire that uh, when they're, they're making that first offering, the first sacrifice there at the sacrificial altar, the fire of God from heaven comes down and, and burns that offering, and the glory, the Shekinah, the, the glory of the Almighty fills the tabernacle. The exact same thing that happens 500 some odd years later with the first temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple. Solomon, he's praying to Yehovah God. And then, as recorded in 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of Yehovah filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of Yehovah because the glory of Yehovah filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of Yehovah above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to Yehovah, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. He is good. His love endures forever. The glory of Yehovah fills the temple to, to, to a point when the, the glory is so great, so immense, so powerful that the, the priests could not enter the temple. They, they couldn't do it. It, it. just In that presence of the Almighty God, you just have to fall down and just give praise and worship to God. And it's that same image. This is the Shekinah. This is the, the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Almighty Yehovah. And yes, this is the same image. This is the same. Like these, these are all, whether it's the, the, the Shekinah glory of God that's dwelling within the burning bush, uh, which is done through, by the way, the angel of Yehovah that is there, the messenger of Yehovah that was sent by Yehovah right there, the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, or the tabernacle in the wilderness, or the temple here in Jerusalem. These are all letter of the word images pointing to the spirit of the word that through the messenger of Yehovah God, he who is that prophet like Moses, the the angel of the covenant, the messenger of the covenant, 
we receive the same thing in that spiritual sense, that spiritual fire, that that spirit of Yehovah. That, as Paul says, do you do you not know that you are the temple of the living God, and the spirit of God dwells in you? This this is what it's talking about. Is that just as the the glory of the Almighty came into the tabernacle. It was in the bush. It was in the tabernacle. It was there at the temple in Jerusalem and came and filled those three locations to such an extent that it was overpowering, overwhelming. When when Moses was brought, you know, close to the burning bush and that glory of the Almighty just shining out through the messenger, the servant of the Almighty, the angel of Yehovah, the word of God came to Moses saying, take off your sandals from off your feet for the place you stand is holy. This is, this is holiness. This is a place of sanctification. This is the place where that the image being whether you're wearing sandals or whether you're wearing shoes, you're out there in the world and you're tracking all of the stuff of the world, the dirt and the, the dust and the mud and the grime and the filth that's all there caked on the bottom of your sandals and your shoes, you, you, you remove all of that. You leave the world totally behind, get that dust of the world away from you, and you come forth into that, that glory of God. We are that image, that spiritual eternal image of that burning bush. We are that image of that tabernacle in the wilderness. We are that image of the temple in Jerusalem. And if you, if you are drawing near to God so that he will draw near to you, and you're calling out to the Almighty in faith in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, then you, like these locations, are filled with the spiritual and eternal fire of God. You are the, the spirit of Yehovah comes and dwells, Shekinah, within you, lives within you, abides, camps <laughs> within you. And it's all made possible, all made possible through the gift of Yehovah, his beloved son, Yeshua. Amen. Like what John the Baptist says, and I'll just conclude this this one thought. You know, John the Baptist says, you know, that I I can baptize you with water. I can do that. But the one who is coming after me, I am not worthy to unlatch the, the sandals of his feet. I am not worthy. He, he has authority to baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit. Amen. And so, the favor of him who dwelt, who Shekinah, in the burning sne in the bush. Moving on to Zebulun and Issachar. We, about Zebulun, Moses said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going out, and you, Issachar, in your tents. They, these two brothers, or these two tribes, will summon peoples to the mountain and there offer the sacrifices of the righteous. They will feast on the abundance of the seas, on the treasures hidden in the sand. And again, we don't, we don't have the historical context of, to know exactly what it is that Moses is referring to. We just don't know. And it's always, it's, you know, always a, a very dangerous thing to just guess, you know, a lot of people start doing that. They just, you know, they play the guessing game and it's like, we don't play that. We, we simply acknowledge there are things we don't know because we are 3,500 years removed from the history and the culture and the context. We just don't know. But what we can certainly say is that there was some type of, of mutual, um, you know, beneficial arrangement, uh, very clear friendship between these two tribes, that it was, uh, you know, they, they supported each other, they worked together. We could certainly say that. Gad, about Gad, Moses said, Bless, Blessed is he who enlarges Gad's domain. Gad lives there like a lion, tearing at arm or head. 
He chose the best land for himself. The leader's portion was kept for him. When the heads of the people assembled, he carried out Yehovah's righteous will and his judgments concerning Israel. About Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's cub springing out of Bashan. About Nephtali, he said, Nephtali is abounding with the favor of Yehovah and is full of his blessing. He will inherit southward to the lake. And the lake being referred to there, most would most believe, and I believe, you know, this is correct, is that it's the lake that's being referred to is the Sea of Galilee. You basically have three bodies of water in or around Israel. You've got the Sea of Galilee, you've got which is a freshwater lake, it's not a sea, but in Hebrew they don't have a word for lake. Every body of water in Hebrew is just known as a sea, whether it's something as massive as the Mediterranean Sea or uh, the Black Sea. Those are seas, but something as small as the, uh, the lake uh, uh, known, uh, w what we would call the Lake of Galilee. No, it's they, they refer to it as the Sea of Galilee. But there's three of them. There's the Sea of Galilee, there's the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea, and then there's the Mediterranean. And most you know, believe that uh, this particular lake that's being referred to is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, he will inherit southward to the lake. About Asher, he said, Most blessed of sons is Asher. Let him be favored by his brothers, and let him bathe his feet in oil. The bolts of your gates will be iron and bronze, and your strength will equal your days. So. The, the tribe of Asher, there's, there's a clear image there of Asher was extremely faithful, even though there's very little about Asher that we actually know. I mean, there's very little we know about Asher. Practically nothing. <laughs> I mean, practically nothing. We, we know very, very little about the individual or about the tribe. But at the very least, you can say that this was a tribe that was favored by God and would have been favored because this was a tribe that would have been obedient to the commandments of the Almighty. And that obedience is bringing these blessings. That the, the quote, bolts of your gates will be iron and bronze and your strength will equal your days. And that concludes the blessings that are given to the individual tribes. And once again, for whatever reason, Simeon is just not mentioned. He's just not there. Moses continues and says, There is no one, oh, I love this, there is no one like the God of Yeshuran, of, of Israel, the upright one. There is no one like the God of Yeshuran, who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will drive out your enemies before you, saying, destroy them. So Israel will live in safety. Amen to that. Israel will live in safety. Jacob will dwell secure in a land of grain and new wine where the heavens drop dew. Blessed are you, Israel. Who is like you, a people saved by Yehovah? He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you, and you will tread on their heights. Gotta love that. <laughs> like, you just gotta love that. That final paragraph, we gotta read that one more time. And let's, let's acknowledge the letter of the, the word, what it's speaking of, and the letter's fulfillment with the Jewish people, but specifically, you, you gotta always be looking to the spirit and truth of these things, those that are truly Yeshurun, those that are the upright ones, those that are valiant, those that are faithful, those that are being obedient to the commandments of the Almighty and living out their faith through their righteous actions. Those that are truly Yeshurun, Moses is saying, blessed are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Yehovah. 
Amen. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Letter of the word fulfilled, spirit and truth of the word fulfilled. Those who are faithful to the Almighty God, we are those that are that, that have been saved by Yehovah. Saved by Yehovah through the gift of his word, written word, but specifically and most importantly, his living word. He who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. But if you are faithful to the Almighty God, then the atonement of Yeshua covers you. As it says in 1 John chapter 1, that we got to read this. We got to read this. This is so good. This is so good. So, so good. Let's get to 1 John chapter 1. And it says here, um, is this where it says it? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we, and we proclaim to you the eternal life with which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. That, ah, oh, is that, where does it say it? Hmm. It's, uh, let's see. I'm going to, I'm going to find this. I got to find this. This is so good. Let's see. Sins of the whole world. Oh, there it is. It's chapter 2. I knew it was First John, but it's not chapter 1. It's chapter 2. I, I apologize. Here it is. Here it is. Okay. Ver chapter 2, verse 2. John says, He is he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is, repeat that, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and he's writing to the believers here. He says, you know, my dear children, you, you that are being faithful to Jesus Christ, that he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the answer to that question of, well, what about those people that are, you know, people are, you know, they always bring up like the pygmies in the, in the heart of the Congo, or they bring up, you know, the, those in the, 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 the tribes, you know, there in the, the heart of the Amazon rainforest, or, 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 or those that have lived in times past where they just, they never had an opportunity to know Jesus. They never had an opportunity to hear the word of God. They just don't know these things. First of all, and this is most important, is what our Lord Yeshua says, is that those who knew the will of the Master and did things worthy of beatings will be beaten with many. But those that did not know the will of the Master and did things worthy of beatings will be beaten with few. Because unto whom much is given, much is required. The more light that you have, the more truth that you have, the more knowledge that you are blessed with by the Almighty God, the more is expected of you, okay? And those that, that have that greater light and greater knowledge and truth and rebel against it, then the greater punishment, the, the more severe punishment is upon those individuals, those that know the will of the master and do things worthy of beatings will be beaten with many. But those that do not know the will of the master and do things worthy of beatings will be beaten with few. So that's the first thing is God's mercy and his grace over such individuals is, is 
to a much greater extent. It you know, covers them to a much greater degree. But also, because Yeshua the Messiah is the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, and he was slain not only for our sins, but was slain for the sins of the whole world, when you have individuals in these circumstances who are living a genuinely good life, even, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have the direct word in front of them. They don't have this, but they do, they're, they're born into this world knowing right and wrong, and they are adhering as best as they know they're adhering to what's right and what's good and what's true, and they're living a good and wonderful life, a life of charity, a life of love, of compassion, of mercy. They're seeking truth in whatever sphere they happen to live. Okay, the reality is they're covered. God's grace and God's mercy offered through Yeshua the Messiah completely and wholeheartedly covers. They, they're, they're covered. They're good. They are saved. Because they are, even without having in this life a, a absolute clear knowledge of exactly who God is and who the Messiah is, they still are living according to the will of the Father. And those are they who enter the kingdom of heaven. Because... Just because you are a, quote, quote, Christian and you call Jesus your, quote, Lord, that is not a guarantee that you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua is very clear on that point. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those that do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And there's going to be all, there's many people on Judgment Day who you're going to be saying, you know, to Jesus, Lord, Lord, didn't, didn't we prophesy in your name? And didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do all these wonderful works in your name? And, and on that day, Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. That's very important. That's very, very important. He says, I, now, you guys, you guys. You might have thought that you knew me, but guess what? I didn't know you. So depart from me, you that practice lawlessness, Torahlessness. Get out of here. But for these individuals who even not fully knowing, not fully knowing the will of the master, but still living a good and honorable, just, true life, a life of goodness and mercy and love and compassion and faithfulness and loyalty, oh, you better believe Yeshua knows them. Huh? You get that? Okay. There's plenty of people in this world who call themselves Christians, and Jesus doesn't know any of them. There's plenty of those types of so-called Christians who call Jesus their Lord. But Jesus is saying, I never knew you. These people, though, I, I know them. My Father knows them, and I know them, and they're good. They're covered. Because I was sacrificed not just for those that know and believe and are being faithful to that knowledge and that truth, but I was also sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. So important, <laughs> so important. And all these people, all of those that are ultimately saved, they are, they are Israel. They are of the household of God. They are saved by the Almighty. They are those that are a people saved by Yehovah. Mm, love it. Mm. Blessed are you, Israel. Who is like you, a people saved by Yehovah? He, Yehovah, is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Ooh, gotta just stop and just, oh, I love it. I mean, this is, this is after all, the sword of Yehovah ministries. <laughs> and Yehovah, his word, his word truly is a glorious, glorious sword. This ministry, 
my calling, let me say this, my calling, what I know my calling is in this life is to use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, use the sword of truth to slice and dice the lies of the enemy, expose the lies for what they are and help individuals come out from those lies as God empowers me to do so into the light of truth. And that's what God's glorious sword does. His sword is truth. He is truth. And I just, I love what it says here that he, he is your shield and he is my shield. He's your helper. He is my helper and he's your glorious sword. And he is my glorious sword and your enemies will cower before you and you will tread on their heights. Your enemies will cower before you. That makes me think, I got to read this. Got to read this. This is also so good. It just made me think of this. Book of the Revelation, chapter 3. This is speaking to the faithful uh, church at Phil Philadelphia. So chapter 3 says here that verse 9 I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, uh, though they are not. That's not talking about anything that a lot of people out there are saying. No, no, no. That's talking about just those that are claiming to be Israelites. And they are not Israelites because they're not being faithful to the, the will of the Father. Just like there are plenty of people who call themselves Christians, but they are not actually true Christians. To be a Christian means that you are a follower of the Christ, and there are plenty of people who claim to be Christian who are not following the Christ. So those who are of the synagogue of Satan, uh, but they are liars, they, these who are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Mm. What does it say here? Your enemies will cower before you. I will make those, whether it's in this life or the next, those who are your enemies, they will be brought to cower before you. And they will know that God and Christ have loved you, Israel. So your enemies will cower before you and you will tread on their heights. And we have to read Psalm 90. You might be thinking, what? Well, all of a sudden we're, we're in Deuteronomy 33 and now we're going to Psalm 90? Yes, we have to go to Psalm 90 because Psalm 90 is the one psalm of the 150 psalms that is attributed to Moses. Yes, Moses wrote, you know, I mean, we have the song of Moses in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 15, the first song of Moses after the Red Sea crossing. We have that which is officially called the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. But we also have Psalm 90, which is written by Moses. And so we got to read this. And it also says the same thing that Moses in the title is that this is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Psalm 90, verse 1, it begins with, Lord, Adonai in the Hebrew. Adonai, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or <laughs> before the mountains were born. What an image, I love it. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, mm. you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new but by evening it is dry and withered. Yep. Our mortal lives, and it doesn't matter whether, whether you were in the time of, you know, Father Abraham and, you know, and Seth and Enosh and, you know, all of them, Methuselah, all of these, you know, patriarchs before the flood of Noah that are living to be 900 plus years old, 
doesn't matter. Or whether you live to be 900 or whether you live to be 90, our mortal lives are just, they're, they're nothing compared to the, the everlasting nature of the Almighty God. From everlasting to everlasting, he who was, who is, who always will be, he alone is God. And I love this, that a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. And I love that because Second Peter chapter 3, we got to turn there really quick. And you just know that this is what Peter is drawing upon. When Peter, in Second Peter chapter 3, he's uh, prophesying about the last days and he's prophesying about the time to come. Uh, when the wicked will be destroyed, the, those that are scoffers, those that are willfully ignorant and following their own evil desires, and they're scoffing at the truth, and they, um, the same word, uh, the present heavens, the first heaven and first earth, are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. He then says this in verse 8, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day, is is another way of saying that Yehovah is timeless. He, he exists beyond space, time, and matter. He created space, time, and matter. And something that, oh, I, I just loved this. I, I, I truly loved this image. And it's so appropriate with what we've been reading uh, here uh, in uh, Psalm 93 through 6, all about Yehovah turning people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals, that uh, Yehovah sweeps people away in the sleep of death. They are like new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. And it's all this, this image of Yehovah being timeless, that a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. One of my favorite um, teachers, Bible teachers, is... Uh, Dr. Dino, Kent Hovind. He's uh, actually, he's the first, he is the first individual that God used in my life to really introduce me to the Bible and the truthfulness of the Bible. The, 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 the rock of truth that the Bible is. Go, going back many years ago, uh, whether it was 13, 14 years ago, I don't even know. It was probably about 14 years ago. I went before the Father with a prayer, and to paraphrase, my prayer was, Father, I just want the truth. I just want the truth, no matter what that is, and if you will reveal your truth to me, I promise that I will do everything I, I can I, to always strive in it, to walk in it. I will, I will strive to be true to it if you will just reveal it to me. And God hears those prayers and answers those prayers. Because soon afterward, God introduced me to uh, Kent Hovind on YouTube in a, a video entitled, I'll never forget the title of this video, it was entitled, 100 Reasons Why Evolution is Stupid. <laughs> I saw that video you know, pop up in my feed and I'm like, what? I gotta check this out. This, keep in mind, this was like 14 years ago. And having been raised in the false religion of Mormonism, I had been taught my entire life that, yeah, God used evolution, you know, bring us about in millions and billions of years and all this other, you know, garbage. And Kent Hovind was the individual that first introduced me to the truth of the Bible, the truth of creation science, and, and was one of the first big steps for me on this path of coming out from lies and walking in the path of truth. Now, why am I bringing up Kent Hovind? It's because in the context of this psalm and God being a timeless being beyond space, time, and matter, and that you know our mortal lives are just nothing, 
something that Kent Hovind said was that God is already standing at your funeral. And that was like, whoa, 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 what, what an image. <laughs> what an image. Now, this is something that I've, I've taught with this ministry before, and I'm going to mention it again here, is that Yehovah, being the omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent spirit of holiness, the eternal spirit and holy spirit of truth, he's not just omnipresent in some physical and spiritual sense that he's present everywhere simultaneously throughout the universe in the here and now. No, because Yehovah exists beyond space, time, and matter, he's a timeless being, means that at all stages of time, whether past, present, or future, he's there also. See, we, we are trapped as mortals. We're trapped in time. I, Jake Hilton, am trapped right here and right now, Saturday, March 30th of 2024 at uh, my time, 9.06 p.m. 9.06 p.m. Mountain Time, U USA. I'm trapped right here and right now in this, this now moment of linear time. But that's not Yehovah being a timeless, omnipresent, supreme being, Yehovah is already standing at my funeral. He already knows. He already knows. And he already knows, even before the foundation of the world, he already knew who would be saved and who would be damned. Now, that doesn't take away our agency in any way, shape, or form. He gives us that. We choose it. We choose either that path of life or that path of death. We choose that. God simply knows because he's there. And when you read a passage like this, it's just, it's so powerful that he is God. You are from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, and you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. He's there, he's here, and he's there. Simultaneously. In all places and in all times. Simultaneously. <laughs> brain just exploded all right second peter chapter three we mentioned that and we we are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation <clears throat> you have set our iniquities before you our secret sins in the light of your presence Ooh, that there are so many you know, so many people who think that they can they can get away with, you know, things, right? You know, they can do what they do in, in the shadows and in the darkness, and no one sees me, no one will find me, no one will figure it out. God sees, <laughs> okay? God knows that those iniquities, that those those sins, that lawlessness is set before Yehovah, that those secret sins are in the light of his presence. And all our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. And this is, goes back to what I was saying about the only things that last are those eternal things. The things that we can and should be doing and focusing on right here and right now in this world those things of God, those things of righteousness, those things of salvation, those are the things that endure. We can live 70 or 80 years or even 90 years, and some people even make it to the, you know, the, the three digits, they make it to 100 years. Well, great. But you know what? As Moses says here, even the best of those years are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. 
our lives are over. Our mortal lives. If only we knew the power of your anger, as in, you better believe that if the people of the world, if they had a, a fear, a real fear of God, of his righteousness of, and his righteous wrath against evil, you'd have a lot more people towing the line. You'd have a lot more people walking in the path of righteousness in life. You see, when you remove a fear of God and a fear of, of hell and a fear of destruction from among the people, that's when people just are let off the hook. You know, they're, they're just, they're off the leash and they just go running wild doing whatever they think they, they can, you know, do because it's like, Hey, you know, I only got 80 years to live. YOLO. You only live once. I'm just going to have fun. And okay, you're going to fly away into destruction. But if people had a, a real fear of God, well, then they, they wouldn't do this. It, it's like our Lord Yeshua. Yeshua says that do not fear what men can do to you because they they can only kill the body. And once they've killed the body, their power is over. They, they can't do anything beyond that. But fear him who, after he is killed, he has authority or he has power to destroy both body and soul in hell. Yes, fear him. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Yes, teach us to recognize that we're only here for a short period of time. You know what? I'm, I'm 40 years old. Okay, it was January 6th of this year, 2024, that I turned the big four zero. I am 40 years old. What is the number that, you know, Moses uses here in this very passage? You know, uh, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. 80 years? Okay, well, it's like if I reach it to 80, well, then I'm halfway there. Okay, I'm halfway there. That's how fast it goes. We need to have that wisdom to number our days so that we may gain that heart of wisdom, so that we may use our time in the here and now wisely for those things of an eternal nature. Relent, Yehovah, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. And that makes me think of John chapter 16, where Yeshua, after, the, uh, after they've left the upper room where the Last Supper took place, Yeshua says to his 11 faithful disciples that in this world you will have tribulation. You're going to have tribulation in this, in this world. But your sorrow will turn to joy. That just as a woman who is entering labor and is giving birth, she is in immense amount of tribulation and pain. All of that pain is forgotten once the, once the son or the child is delivered. Because a child has been brought into the world. And that sorrow is forgotten and it's replaced with joy. And that's what Yeshua promises is that your sorrow, your pain, your hardships will turn into joy. And no one, this is his promise, no one will take away your joy. No one. Forever. Amen. <laughs> May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of Yehovah our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And with that, brothers and sisters, we're going to be getting into the final chapter of the Torah, the very final chapter, chapter 34 of Deuteronomy. And uh, we'll be getting right into that after this short two-minute intermission. Thank you for joining me thus far. Two short minutes. We'll be right back. Stick with me.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And here we are, the final chapter of the Torah, Deuteronomy, or Devarim, words, chapter 34. The man of God, the servant of God, Moses. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pishka, across from Jericho. There Yehovah showed him the whole land, from Gilead to Dan, all of Nephtali, the, tower, uh, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. And it needs to be pointed out that physically speaking, physically speaking, from the summit of Mount Nebo, which is across, it's on the eastern side of the Jordan River, uh, pretty much just across from the Dead Sea. It's right there, you know, east of the Jordan River uh, from the Dead Sea. It's impossible to see all of these regions from the summit of Mount Nebo. Y you can't, not, not with your physical eyes. You can today, from the summit of Mount Nebo, catch a glimpse of the city Jerusalem. You have the Dead Sea before you, so you have the valley before you, you have the Dead Sea, you have Jericho over here, then you have the mountain slopes going up, and right there at the top of the mountain, yes, you can actually see Jerusalem. <laughs> but all of these areas that uh, he's seeing, all the way to the Mediterranean and to the north and to the south and all of that, it's, it's not physically possible to see all of these things with these things, with your, your natural eyes. But that's just it. Listen to this. It says, There, at the summit of Mount Nebo, there Yehovah showed him the whole land. This is a very similar thing. Uh, obviously, totally different being. I mean, <laughs> this is Yehovah God, the holy, 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 and one and only true God, showing Moses all of this. But it does, of course, make me think of the uh, three temptations of Yeshua the Messiah, as recorded in the Gospels, Gospel of Matthew and Luke, where he's brought up to a high mountain by the enemy, by Satan. And it says specifically in the Gospel of Luke that in a moment of time, in vision, the enemy, Satan, showed Yeshua all the kingdoms of the whole world and all of their splendor. Yeshua didn't see those things with his natural eyes. He saw them with spiritual eyes. He saw them in vision. And it would be the same thing here, is that, yes, Moses does go up to the summit of Mount Nebo, and from the summit of Mount Nebo, you can see a, a significant portion of the valley before you. You've got Masada, you've got the Dead Sea, you've got the Dead Sea Valley, you've got Jericho, you've got the mountains going north and south, you've got Jerusalem in the distance. There's plenty you can see there, but to see everything that's mentioned in, in this passage, it's because Yehovah is showing Moses the whole land. He would have seen the entire land from north to south, the entire land of Israel. And then Yehovah said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes. And yeah, with his natural eyes, he would have seen a portion of it, but it would have been with those spiritual eyes. I've let you see the whole of it in, in vision. Would be, would be the only actual way to understand this passage, is that Yehovah is showing him the whole land. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of Yehovah, died there in Moab, as Yehovah had said, and he buried him, as in God buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died, 
yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. And the Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what Jehovah had commanded Moses. And since then, and I, I personally don't like that translation, since then, the, the way it can be translated, and this is actually the way that the, the Jews do translate it, uh, this is the way that they've translated it from the Hebrew scrolls into their uh, Jewish uh, English translation, uh, text of the Hebrew scriptures, is they translate it as never again. Not since then, but never again. There, there, there isn't a prophet that arises in Israel like Moses until, of course, that prophet who was prophesied to be the prophet like Moses, our Lord Yeshua. And that's how I believe it should be translated. It's not since then, but never again has there been a prophet that has risen in Israel like Moses, whom Yehovah knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders Yehovah sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the conclusion of the Torah. That is the conclusion of the Torah. And I tell you, it really has been an amazing adventure. It has been so fun. It has been such a wild, amazing, fun ride where so much has been learned, so much has been discovered, so much has been revealed, so much is, you know, that, that we have all deepened our understanding of the word of God, of the nature of God, the will of God. We have seen just how true David's words are in one of my all-time favorite psalms, Psalm 19, verse 7, that the Torah of Yehovah is perfect. We have seen it. We have put it to the test. We have. I mean, over this last year and a half, of study, deep, deep study into this word, we have truly put the word of God to that test. And we have absolutely found that the word, the Torah of Yehovah is perfect. Or as King Solomon says in the Proverbs, that every word of Yehovah is flawless. It's like a flawless diamond. And it's been, it's been so amazing as we've done this. And I just, I felt that bringing the final Torah portion teaching to a close, it would be appropriate to do a, 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 a quick, very quick review of what we have seen. Starting with the book of Genesis, we had Torah portion number one, Bereshit, in the beginning God, where we went through four prophecies from the beginning prophecy, the creation prophecy, the end prophecy, uh, the, the, genealog uh, the genealogical prophecy, all of them there in Torah portion number one. Torah portion two, Noach, it's all about the name. It's all about the name of Yehovah, but those there at the Tower of Babel, like Nimrod, they wanted to have a name for themselves. Nimrod, literally meaning he who rebels. The, he, he's, he's that rebellious one. Torah portion three, Lech Lecha, all about Father Abraham and the fact that he was 100% Hebrew, the first Hebrew, but he's also 100% human and makes mistakes just like we all do. Torah portion four, Vayera, Lot's daughters and the sin of Sodom. 
And that was a big Torah portion there where we actually, I mean, we conclusively showed that what Lot did in Sodom, oh, it was just pure wrong. It was immoral and extremely, extremely wrong what Lot did. But uh, the sin of Sodom that was and the destruction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Amwim Zebun, Torah portion 5, Chaye Sarah, God's search for his princess, Sarah in the Hebrew, literally meaning princess, and humble, beautiful woman. That, that even when God's command specifically went to Abraham, Abraham, take your family, your flocks, your herds, take it all and, and go into this land, cross over the river Euphrates, become that first Hebrew, that first crossed over one, and go into this, this foreign land, to just sojourn in this land. And you know what? His wife, I'm coming with you. Let's go. We're, we're a team. We're side by side through all of it. And humble, amazing woman. In fact, even Peter, in First Peter, uh, I want to say First Peter chapter 3, uh, gives uh, credit to Sarah as being a wonderful, amazing woman, an amazing wife, who was humble and meek and submissive. Just the image of what we should be, the image of what the bride to the bridegroom should be. Willfully submit to our Lord. Torah portion number six, Toldot, the blessed second son. Oh my goodness, the blessed second son. That was one of the biggest things that has been revealed, you know, from God, you know, to me and through this work. And what started out just seeing a pattern of six to eight examples, the number is actually, it's over 40. It's over 40 examples of the blessed second son prophecy. Just at some point in the future, I'm going to have to do another teaching on the blessed second son and do a full, complete list because it's, it's huge. It's an absolute huge list of what God has done. Torah portion number seven, but yet on the high, are you on the highway to hell or on the stairway to heaven? Number eight, the Yishlach, the greatest wrestling match of all time, where Jacob becomes Israel, that image of what we should be, that we are those that wrestle with God and with man, mankind, and if we are faithful, we come off victorious. That's what Israel is. We come off victorious. Torah portion number nine, the Yeshev. Slavery, prostitution, rape, oh my, oh gosh. And then we had the, uh, the three tam uh, Tamar prophecy in that. Torah portion 10, Miketze, from prisoner to prince, all about Joseph. Torah portion 11, Va Yishkash, embrace being the abomination of the Egyptians. <laughs> because the, the lamb, or to sacrifice a lamb, was, uh, it was an abomination to the Egyptians, you know, that's something that they just, you know, could not, would not do. Um, but that's something we need to embrace is you look at the Egyptians as being an image of the world. And we look at our Lord Yeshua as the perfect example of what we should do and what we should be. And it's like, okay, if the world hates Yeshua, well, that's what Yeshua says to disciples. The world's going to hate you, but the world hated me before it hated you. So just embrace it. If the world calls us, you know, that enemy and that abomination, great. That's fine. Embrace it. Torah portion 12, by Yechchi. Uh, this was a fun one. Dear Mormons, not everything is about you and about America. <laughs> and that was Genesis. And then moving into the second book of Moses, Exodus or Shemot. It was Torah portion 13, Shemot. Pharaoh's tyranny and the spirit of truth. Va'er. Va'era, the only true God, goes to war with Egypt. Number 14, all about the ten plagues of Egypt. Number 15, Bo, salvation and destruction at the feast of Passover. Number 16, Bashelach, behold the salvation of Yehovah. Absolutely amazing, the Red Sea crossing. Number 17, Yitro, the Almighty God speaks from the cloud and fire. Oh, yes. Yehovah, the Almighty, descending upon the summit of Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, Sine, the mountain of, quote, my bush. He speaks his Ten Commandments to the whole house of Israel. 
Number 18, Mishpatim, Moses receives instruction or he receives Torah from God on the summit of Mount Sinai. Number 19, Terumah, you are the temple of the living God. Amen. Number 20, Tetzaveh, the high priest with its with Israel over his heart. Amen. A beautiful image of our Lord Yeshua as the high priest with with us. The the bride held close to his heart as a precious precious gem that's why that's why israel is represented as these precious gems right there over the breastplate of the high priest of israel number 21 key tisa uh, tisa israel and the lure of the golden calf oh yeah that's uh, exodus chapter 32 there Number 22, hell, no fire on the Sabbath? What? Is that is that really what it's all about, that commandment about no fire on the Sabbath? Oh, no, 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 no. That's uh, definitely went into that, and we answered those questions in that Torah portion. Number 23, Pekhude, the glory of God fills the tabernacle, just as we were talking about in this teaching, the Shekhinah, the, the glory of God filling the tabernacle, filling the temple, filling each and every one of us, that spiritual fire of the Almighty God. And that was the book of Exodus. And then we got into Leviticus, the third book. And we had number 24, Vayikra, the spirit and truth of God's Torah. Number 25, Tzva, or Tzav, excuse me, Tzav, slain from the foundation of the world, our Lord Yeshua, beautiful prophetic image of our Lord. Number 26, Shemini, which is, I entitled it, Don't Touch My Bacon, because, gosh, I tell you, once you get into the dietary laws of, like, Leviticus chapter 11, and then also repeated in Deuteronomy 14, this is one of the biggest things that a lot of people, you know, they, they have beef with, or they have pork with, you know, as most of them have, you know, so don't, don't you dare touch my bacon, and, and, I tell you, there are so many Bible teachers out there, or, you know, they call themselves Bible teachers that will even use uh, Acts chapter 10, you know, with this Acts chapter 10, with this vision of the, the unclean animals being brought down in this sheet, this vision three times given to Peter in Acts chapter 10, and they say, hey, you know, hey, you know, you can eat whatever you want. That's what that vision is all about. And it's like, no, it is not. <laughs> okay. No, it is not. Acts chapter 10 is all about taking the gospel to the Gentiles. That's what Acts chapter 10 is all about. It has nothing to do with, you know, God removing the dietary laws of his Torah. Nothing whatsoever. It's about taking the gospel to the Gentile nations that the Jews at during the first century, and honestly still many of them, or certainly the more religious, uh, orthodox religious of them to this day, they refer to the Gentile nations as heathens or unclean. They even refer to them as dogs, uh, the, you know, heathen, unclean animals is, you know, how many of the first century Jews looked at the nations of the world. They were unclean animals. And it's like, no, what God says to Peter is that concerning those people that are living a righteous life, do not call them unclean. They are cleansed. They are cleansed. They are purified. They are my people. That's what the whole chapter of Acts chapter 10 is about. It's about Cornelius, this Roman centurion, and his whole household coming into a knowledge of the truth, an angel of God appearing to Cornelius. It's about bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. It's about Cornelius and his family being born again, being filled with the fire and the spirit of Almighty God, Yehovah, and then being baptized and enter, entering into covenant relationship with God. That, I mean, there is nothing in Acts chapter 10 that is about getting rid of dietary laws. There's nothing in the Bible about getting rid of dietary laws. It just does not exist. Does not exist. So that was uh, Shemini. We went to deep into that one. Don't touch my bacon, is what a lot of people say. And it's just like, nope, sorry, that's not what the Bible teaches. Torah portion number 27, ta, ta, uh, Tazria. tazria. Uh, question, is the Torah sexist? And uh, the answer to that is a big no, absolutely not. 
the the Torah is so good and so pure and so perfect and so equal among all. In fact, it is the only law of the ancient and still to this day many modern nations that teaches that equality between men, women, and children, and even servants, even slaves. We covered this in a recent Torah portion, how the covenant of God is for all and for all time. doesn't matter if you're a man, a woman, a child, a servant, slave, does not matter. The covenant is for all. And so is the Torah sexist? No, most certainly it is not. Torah portion number 28, Metzorah, revealing the mystery of the leper's law. Oh, we went deep into that one. It was so awesome. I love that. Torah portion 29, Acharemot, the wicked goat destined for Azazel, an image of the enemy, Hasatan, being driven off to uh, Azazel or driven off to hell is the, the image of that. Torah portion 30, Kedoshim, be holy because Yehovah is holy. Holy living is what we're called to do. Torah portion 31, Immor, the holy days of Yehovah God, the seven feasts and festivals of Yehovah, as we got into Leviticus chapter 23. Torah portion 32, Bechar, the truth of the Shemitah. There's so much about the Shemitah that a lot of people, you know, rave about and talk about, but we got to the truth of what the Shemitah is really all about. And Torah portion 33, Bechukotai, Israel, the queen who became a whore, unfortunately. God's people who at many times in world history have turned from the path of righteousness to the path of wickedness. And that was Leviticus. And then we got into Numbers, the book of Numbers, the fourth book. And we started with Torah portion 34, Bamidbar, meaning in the desert. And that's what the book means in Hebrew, in the desert. The Messiah miracle in the desert. That was a fun one. That was awesome. Got to see that. And Torah portion number 35 also. Naso, the body of Christ prophecy. Two Torah portions where the, the prophetic image of what God shows concerning the coming Messiah is just unbelievable. It's absolutely glorious and so amazing. So that was Torah portion 35. Naso, Torah portion 36. Baha. Lortecha, let us go with you, Yeshua, and that image of our Lord Yeshua, the image of uh, Emmanuel, God with us, because the Spirit of the Almighty God fills Yeshua to fullness. And when you see Yeshua, you see the express image of God. You see the, the, the mind of God, the heart of God, the will of God, the word of God lived out perfectly. Torah portion 37, Shelach, spy out the land and face the giants. All about spying out the land. 38, Korah, the spirit of rebellion. This was all about Korah and Dathan and Abiram and their rebellion against Moses and Aaron. 39, Kut, Kat, excuse me, red heifers, water from rocks, and fiery serpents is what we covered in that one. 40, Balak, uh, this is uh, we call, what I called an ass speaks twice. <laughs> yeah, King Balak of Moab hiring Balaam, the, uh, the pagan prophet, and it's in that Torah portion where you have um, an ass speaking twice. First his donkey and then himself. <laughs> 41, Pinchas. The sin and doctrine of Balaam, and this was also uh, going into the detail about the Baal of Peor abomination and incident. 42, we did a dual Torah portion here. 42 and 43 was Matot and Maseh in a teaching, don't mess with the Almighty. Amen. Do not mess with the Almighty, for vengeance belongs to him. And that was Numbers. And bringing it to the final book of Deuteronomy, Fifth book of Moses, Torah portion 44, the mighty words, the Devarim of Moses, 45, oh, Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. The Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6, the greatest commandment in the Torah. Listen and obey, Israel. 
Torah portion 46, Echev, the hornet driving out the pests. Amen. 47, Re'e, the letter and spirit of God's Torah. And yes, I, I came to realize later that I had two Torah portion teachings named in the same title there. But hey, that's one of the things that this ministry is always about is, yes, we, we know the letter of the word and what the letter is really all about. We have to understand the word according to its history and culture and context and perspective and language. And we have to know the letter, but we're also always looking to the spirit and truth of God's word. 48, Shoftim, the prophet like Moses prophecy, the prophecy of prophecies, as I call it. 49, Ki Tetze, commandments and context is everything, everything. It really is. Number 50, Kitavo, cursed if you forsake Moses. Amen to that. 51, Nitzavim, a covenant for all and for all time. Amen. 52 and 53, a dual portion we covered here. Va Yelech and Ha Azinu, the song of Moses and the Lamb. And finally, bringing it to a close, Torah portion number 54, Vezot Haberacha, the Torah draws to a close. And that brings Deuteronomy and the whole of the Torah to a close. I tell you, there's there's a part of me that's very sad. <laughs> there's a part of me that's very sad. Um, I've truly loved this. This has been this has been wonderful. This has been a a glorious journey, and I'm so grateful. First and foremost, to my Father in heaven, Yehovah, blessed is His name. I'm so grateful to my Lord and Savior, the Son of God, our Lord Yeshua. And I'm so thankful to each and every one of you, my brothers and sisters, that you have joined me for this, this long journey. And it, it's, been, it's been long, I tell you. But I also tell you this, is that for anyone that would join us for the whole of this journey, and obviously the videos are available, the whole series, what we just went through there and all of that imagery, the whole series is available, the whole Torah portion playlist is available, and you can watch it uh, at any time, go back to any teaching at any time, and you can even watch it, of course, at a faster speed. You don't have to watch it live. Um, it, you can watch it at 1.5 or 1.75 or even 2x speed if you can follow along at that speed, and that's that's wonderful. But I will say this, is that the Torah is a treasure trove of truth and wisdom and light and knowledge and understanding. And for anyone that will, whether they study it to the depth that we've studied it in this teaching series for themselves, or if they so choose to you know, watch the, the Torah portion teaching series as provided by the Sword of Yehovah Ministries for themselves, you will come to know a tremendous amount of, of truth concerning the Word of God concerning God Almighty, and concerning His Son, Yeshua. You will deepen your relationship with God and with the Christ. And you will strengthen your, your walk with them. That, I can promise you. And I bring the Torah and all of these teachings, this whole teaching series, to a close in the hallowed and glorious name of Yehovah, the one and only true God, and the name of his beloved and holy son, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Thank you so very much, my brothers and sisters, for joining me here at the Sword of Yehovah Ministries for this final Torah portion teaching, Vezot Haberacha, Deuteronomy 33, 1 through 34, 12. Saturday, March 30th of 2024. Do we have anything coming up in the immediate future? Well, 
that's that's where things are a little bit shaky right now as far as the the schedule of this ministry is concerned why what's happening months ago this was like way back i think this was back in like september of last year this was a long time ago i mentioned that i had been invited to travel to africa because there is an orphanage in the nation of zambia that is in need of assistance help and i am going to zambia to help out of this orphanage in any way i can i'm also bringing my equipment there because i'm looking to do a small not even close to the level of document of the video that i did about israel not even close not even close like we're talking one fiftieth you know the level of complexity and <laughs> very very small but just a I'm looking to also create a, a video about uh, this orphanage in Zambia and the children there. And ultimately, this, this very short film is, is an image of what, of what we are called to do. And that is to lift up those that lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the, the weakened knees. And to provide for those who are in need, provide for the widows, provide for the orphans. And so I was invited many months ago to travel to Africa to help out at this orphanage in Zambia. And the time has come. I will be flying out, uh, leaving from the Las Vegas airport, flying uh, first to New York City and then to Kenya and then Kenya to Zambia uh, next Thursday. So that's uh, when I'm going to be leaving and I'm going to be gone for two and a half weeks, a two and a half week period. And I get back. And then I just have a few days, you know, where I get to celebrate Passover with my children, with my two girls. Hallelujah. And then they got me flying to North Carolina to participate with the Passover Unleavened Bread event with a Root Awakening International Ministries, the Passover 2024 Return to the Mountain event. So things right now are, are pretty hectic schedule wise, but I can promise you this. I can promise you this over the next month. There will be videos and there will be teachings from this ministry. When will they be uploaded? When will they be done? I, I can't give you an answer on that, but I can promise you this. There will be videos. There will be teachings. You, you will have content being provided to you from this work, the work of the Sword of Yehovah Ministries. That I can promise you 100%. So... Stick with me, my brothers and sisters, and thank you. Thank you for all of your love and all of your support. But the time has come, and I'm going to be getting on that plane heading to Africa in the near future. So rest of the time is yours, my brothers and sisters, for any prayer requests, Q&A, any discussion at all that's happening in the live chat. So let's get there. In the live chat, we've got... Shalom, everyone. Shalom. I hope you all had a wonderful Sabbath day. Yes. Uh, Sister Adriana, thank you. Hope you're feeling much better, she asks. And I mean, it's still there. You could tell that it's still some of it's still there. But yes, praise God. Feeling much, much better. Much better. Thank you. And uh, Brother David with the, uh, the documentary comment. Thank you, Brother David. And thank you, Sister Diana, once again, for the uh, comment on the documentary. And thank you to everyone that is that is sharing the documentary. Thank you. Whether you're sharing it on YouTube or you're sharing it on Facebook or X or uh, Instagram, I, it doesn't matter the platform. It's just getting it out there and sharing it with everyone you can. You know, texting the link to your your family, to your friends, to your coworkers. There, and I can understand that there may be some hesitation maybe even some fear, because there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people out there that are siding with Gaza and hating Israel and hating the Jews and standing against Israel at this time. I understand there's a lot of people out there that are doing that. And I would just encourage all of you in love to be strong and courageous, because that's what Israel is called to be. Be strong and be courageous and make the decision, I am going to share this, and you just copy that link and send that link out there. Send it to as many people as you possibly can, because we, we need to fight. We need to fight against these lies that are being spread about Israel. 
Oh. Uh, let's see. Brother Edward, I saw the Israel documentary film. Thank you, brother. Um, yes, Sister Lydia. It is uh, the title. Um, this is what Brother Kendall says. It is found right here, the Sword of Yehovah Ministries. The title is Am Yisrael Chai. Uh, very easy to find. Uh, you can find it either in the Israel uh, playlist or you can find it uh, just in the recent videos that were uploaded you know, to this uh, channel. It was uploaded just two weeks ago. It's called Am Yisrael Chai. Uh, October October 7th massacre and the Israel Hamas war and uh, very very easy to find Sister Adriana says I remember 2016 it all started with the videos on the holy name of Yehovah and the Jeremiah series and after was the book of Psalms and after that was the chronological gospels yes that's right yeah that's right and I look I, I'll, I'll tell you this one of the reasons why I want to do this upcoming Major Prophets teaching series where we're going to be doing Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel is I want to, I need, not just I want, but I need to go back and I need to redo the Book of Jeremiah teaching series because <clears throat> as I was doing Jeremiah, the first, because it was the year 2017, I was still... Oh, and it just pains me to say it. It does. It churns my stomach to say it. But the 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 year 2017, I was wrestling daily. I was fighting this this war, you know, in my life daily about um, whether Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, was actually a true prophet, and the Book of Mormon was true. And and so as a result, it's it just kills me. But yes, in the first. In the first about half of the Jeremiah series that I did way back in 2017, there's there's bits and pieces of Mormonism in it. And it's just like, oh, gosh, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. It has to be totally redone so that that teaching series can be deleted and all of that Mormonism nonsense from, you know, back in 16 and 17 can just be completely, you know, gotten rid of. So, yeah. That's uh, it's one of the motivations for sure. But yes, after the Jeremiah series, yep, we did the Book of the Psalms. And then after that, we did the Chronological Gospel series. And now we've done the Torah series and we just completed the Torah series. How about that? Brother Edward says, my mom will celebrate Easter tomorrow and I don't want to celebrate Easter anymore. Um, you know, I live with my mom and that's, you know, brother, I... As long as as long as you you know live in that situation, she is your mother, and you are to to honor her, honor your mother. But that doesn't mean that you need to participate in these these holidays and practices that you know are not of Christ. You know, there's you know plenty of people out there, of course, that are you know saying of you know so many Christians believe that you know Easter is all about the death, burial, and particularly the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus and that Christmas is about his birth. And it's just like, that's just not true. You know it's not true. Easter is from the ancient Babylonian fertility goddess, Ishtar. Ishtar, Ashtarte, Astaroth, uh, Estore, Easter, different names, same fertility goddess from different mythologies, different pagan you know, backgrounds. Uh, and you can even look that up in the, like, Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, you can open up the Encyclopedia Britannica and look at uh, Easter and, like, oh, you know, it'll tell you everything about where the word Easter comes from. It comes from the, you know, pagans, from the Babylonian uh, fertility goddess. You know this. And, of course, you know, things like painting eggs and bunny rabbits has nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing whatsoever. These are fertility symbols. You got rabbits that, you know, yeah, they breed like rabbits. This is an image of fertility. The egg, also an ancient pagan image of fertility. Um, Easter, all of it. It's all about pagan fertility worship. And Christmas... Uh, what was known to the Romans as Saturnalia, it was, you know, all about sun god worship. So you basically got sun god worship in the winter solstice and solstice, and you've got fertility goddess worship in the spring after the vernal equinox. These are things that we should not participate in because they just are not of God. If you are living, you know, at your mother's home and she's choosing to participate in these things, okay, well, that's her choice. But you don't have to participate, and that's fine. 
but you know love your mother and you know just love and honor your mother um and and be that light be that light in her life to to offer her a more excellent way the way of truth and if there's opportunity if there's opportunity to introduce the feasts and festivals to her and to talk about passover that it's at the time of passover that jesus was crucified and unleavened bread is this image of christ getting the leaven the sin out of the house of israel and first fruits day of first fruits is the day when he was raised from the dead if there's opportunity in love and kindness to share these things with your family then that's that's wonderful please do <clears throat> yes brother edward celebrate with your mother uh celebrate and maybe look for opportunities to share the truths from the account written uh in the you know again it's just if you if you choose to that's that's fine it's just um but if you decide not to well then you know don't that's fine choose to stand with israel amen um love singing the shema <laughs> yeah i just it, it's it's so beautiful and um <clears throat> i'm i'm you know right here at the the end of the torah i'm going to i'm going to opportunity just to do it one more time because it's it is beautiful Shema Yisrael Yehovah Eloheinu Yehovah Echad Hear, O Israel, Yehovah is our God, Yehovah alone. The Torah of Yehovah is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of Yehovah are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Amen. Happy travels to Africa. May the Lord keep you safe. Thank you. I just shared the link of Am Yisrael Chai to my church group. Amen. Thank you, Sister Adriana. Sister Lydia says, Brother Jake, I've got a question. I recently found out that my property agent, who said she is Christian, is married to a woman, so she's gay. I need advice on how to speak about Yehovah with her. Oh. such a challenge such a challenge when we live in a world where this wicked behavior this completely opposite of the will of god behavior unnatural behavior is is not just accepted but it's celebrated and encouraged and of course anyone who speaks against it oh well you're 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 hateful and you're you know this horrible awful terrible person you're a bigot and all these other things and they they can call us whatever names they want the important thing is we live in accordance with the truth and we will never change anyone's lives if we are joining ourselves to the world. That's what Satan wants. Satan wants Christians to join themselves with the world. We are to be set apart. We are to be different from the world. How, number one, first and foremost, how you are to go about sharing the truth of Yehovah with this woman, you share it by living it by being a light in this world. You share it by showing love. Now love, you need to understand it from the biblical perspective, not from the world's perspective. The world's perspective says that love is acceptance. Love is not acceptance. Love is not acceptance of evil behavior. If someone is walking towards a cliff, love is not letting them go their way. Love is calling out to them to turn and to repent. But love can also be shown in the form of you loving God first and foremost and loving Yeshua the Messiah and being that light and praying. Prayer is powerful. The prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman 
is powerful and it avails much. It accomplishes much. That's first and foremost. You live the truth, love the truth, embrace the truth, and walk in the truth, being separate from the world, different from the world. And prayer. Give it over to God. Pray and ask God for those opportunities. Ask God for those opportunities to share the truth. And let God work with this woman to soften her heart. And when the opportunity comes, you'll know it. A door will open. An opportunity will arise. And when that opportunity arises, in love and with kindness and with a genuine concern for her soul, you can speak to her about these things and call her to likewise walk in the ways of truth. <clears throat> but but we, we need to always acknowledge what it is. The, the behavior of homosexuality is an abomination. It is sin. It is... The, the Hebrew word that God uses to describe it is one of the, the harshest words in all of Hebrew language. It means something that's loathsome, something that's hateful, something that he despises. He, he does. It is, it is vile to the Almighty. But beating her over the head with a hammer is, is just not going to work. So you be the example. You live a life of truth and righteousness. Pray. You pray and you give it over to God and you, you wait on the Lord to provide you with that opportunity. And when the opportunity comes, when her, when her soil is ready, when her ground has been made ready for the seed of the word of God, then you can come in with that word of truth. If, if you're just coming in now, chances are that seed is going to end up on rocky soil or in the thorns, and it's not going to have any effect. So you pray, and you wait for when her soil is ready. And you'll know the opportunity will be there. As long as you are continually seeking it and praying for it, God will use you. God will use you in her life and the lives of many other people to bring them out from sin and into a way of, of righteousness and truth. So that would be my advice on how to speak about Yehovah with her, is start with the example, start with prayer, and then look for that opportunity for when her soil has been made ready. <clears throat> Sister Felicia says, Jake, are you going to stop in Jordan again on the way to Africa? Praise God, no. <laughs> no. I, um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have any desire to go back to the nation of Jordan. I can tell you that. <laughs> mm -mm. Nope. No, I do not. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Thank you. I, I love you all. I truly do. I just, I love you all, my brothers and sisters. And a special thank you with all of my heart. Thank you to those that support the work of this ministry, who have supported it at any time in the past, who are currently supporting it, and those people ha who have yet to support but will. Thank you. This work is only made possible by your support. And so, for each and every one of you, I thank you, and I ask Yehovah God in Yeshua's name to bless you, abundantly bless you, according to the, the richness of his compassion and generosity. So, whether you use Venmo or PayPal or Cash App or checks to the sort of YHVH and sent to that P.O. box, doesn't matter at all. It all goes to take care of my needs, my children's needs, and the needs of this ministry. So thank you so very much for your support. And all of that information is also available in the video description below.
And let's conclude the final Torah portion. Let's conclude it as we always conclude every teaching with the priestly blessing from Numbers chapter 6. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yehovah lift up his countenance, his glorious countenance, his face upon you and give you peace. In the name of his son, Yeshua, the Prince of Peace. Amen. With all of my heart, I offer you all of my love, my brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you. And God bless you all. Have a wonderful weekend, and I promise I will be seeing you all very soon. Shalom and good night.